subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. The print of the cuff presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank in association with Global Insurance Brokers, airline partner SpiceJet in alliance with Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals. We know that coronavirus is staging a comeback, but some of us are being adventurous. Some because we've tasted the virus already, as my guest today, Sanjeev Sanyal, and some in my vintage because we've been vaccinated at least once, and also it's outdoors, so it's probably safer. And we don't have an audience, but this is the next best thing we can do to recording and off the cuff with an audience because our audience has sent us questions so we will be asking many of them so sanjeev sanyal principal economic advisor and a thinking young man thank you so much welcome to off the cuff and you know if we talk start talking about all these areas of your specialization they'll take a long time and i think for each one we'll have to have a different session because you talk you are working on the economy now but you think about urban governance that's one of your favorite areas and also archaeology and history. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll dabble in a little bit of that. But let's first ask some philosophical questions. And it's interesting that I ask you this question sitting in a little zone in Delhi, which in my sort of irreverential moments, which are most of my moments, I call it the new Kremlin. Because <laughs> this is new Muti Bagh, which, uh, which was built for uh, government officers. Uh, also uh, young officers like you uh, and this, this this park is called amphitheater so you can see that when the state wants to do something well they do it really well because this is a top class colony maybe the best in delhi so why is it so that the state and the economy run sort of contradictory to each other well i think uh, that goes to the nub of what do we want our state to do? So, <clears throat> unfortunately, when we talk about the Indian state, you know, obviously we have all various visions of what it should be doing. But at least in my view, we've got ultimately to be very clear about what this Indian state will do. And I think it should be basically a limited but strong state. So, let me contrast it with the Nehruvian idea of a sort of soft, all-pervasive, but weak state. That's the Ashokan state. That's the Ashokan state, which I, and I yeah. write uh, I know, quite yes. a lot you, of... You write that Ashoka laid out everything on an edict. Yeah. Brush your teeth, I mean, I'm simplifying it, brush your teeth in the morning, wake up at this time, sleep at this time. And you have a Dharma Mahamanta, uh, the religious police, who will make sure that you do such thing. Absolutely. Because uh, just like a uh, parent hands over her children to a uh, 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 wet nurse, uh, so Ashoka handed over his subjects to the Dharma Mahamanta. So that's the Maibab Sarkar, classical Maibab Sarkar. Yes. Yeah. So the problem here is that we have imbibed this to such an extent that we want the state to do all these things. It is So I think in the end, we the people of India have got to accept that the state has a role to play. I'm not a libertarian by any means. I believe that the state is needed. But the state has to be limited to doing certain things. It should provide defense, it should provide municipal governance, um, it should perhaps uh, enforce contracts, not the government, but the judiciary, um, justice, things like this, which clearly the market cannot de uh, deliver. For all other things, we have got to allow the rest of the system to do it, private sector, civil society, whatever it is. Um, and the state has got to take the view that in its own purview, it's, it delivers the goods. For the rest, the rest of, the, the rest of society has to also uh, pull along. But unfortunately, this My Bab Sarkar idea is now so well ensconced in our, uh, I think, our bloodstream that whenever something goes wrong, oh my God, the government must intervene and do something about it. Uh, it's not always obvious that it should. Yeah. So, Mr. Modi also, when he built his politics from 2012 onwards nationally, he promised minimum government, maximum governance. That hasn't happened in the past six years. And now I see a lot of emphasis on this, this budget, his speech in parliament, uh, where he said you shouldn't leave everything to IS officers. Others also, entrepreneurs also contribute. They are also working for India. Mm -hmm. And he also said that don't malign wealth creators because unless they create wealth, what will you distribute? Now, we might have been waiting to hear this, but why has it taken this long? 
So, well, uh, my own view on this is that there's, this is an issue of sequencing. Because if you do have, uh, you see, minimum government also brings uh, maximum governance. People hear only one part of it, whichever bit they like to hear and forget the other bit. The fact of the matter is, there was a point in time when, this, when Prime Minister Modi came to power, there were all kinds of issues that were going kind of off kilter. Um, there were serious issues about the banks, uh, about uh, there were a series of scandals, financial scandals, corporate scandals. At that point in time, at least, there had been a series of uh, terrorism attacks in the recent past. So there was a feeling that, first of all, some imposition of order had to be done. The second thing which I think is also important is that a minimum government, maximum governance system also requires that it is a system that is a system of churn, in a sense. You know, new co uh, old companies die, new companies emerge. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in, in the kinds of uh, shocks from globalization are allowed to, in, to some, some degree pass through the system. If you're going to allow that, then you do need to have some sort of a safety net in place in order that the general population buys into this. So this does require that you have a system of basic health insurance. You do have systems for uh, providing direct assistance through, say, the Jandhan uh, schemes. So I think the two are not contradictory. I would argue that this is a case of sequencing. Uh, you know, some people may have preferred that they are one is done faster <laughs> or, they, they were, you know, the they sort of the, the minimum government part of it was done uh, earlier in the sequence. So that's a matter of private uh, personal taste. But I would argue that the maximum government governance part, which is imposition of order and creating these channels for safety nets, was a part of the package. And so, to what extent do you think uh, is the current commitment coming from conviction and how durable is it going to be? Well, I think it comes from conviction. I mean, it certainly comes from, I, I am very much committed to it. We read all my writings uh, and yes. the last no, but few you also economic work, you, surveys. You also work in the system now, so you know what how the system is responding. I would argue they are. I mean, as I said, um, you know, the joke used to be the economic surveys are written by the economists and, and nothing from the economic surveys ever gets implemented. I would argue that the last two or three economic surveys, which I have been fortunate to co-author, uh, have had a very significant impact on what happened uh, subsequently uh, in policy. Uh, whether it's in terms of arguing unapologetically for privatization or the farm laws or the labor laws that were done, but generally about deregulation. And I'll give an example that is a more micro example. Um, since the time of the East India Company, cartography and any geospatial uh, mapping was a monopoly of the Survey of India. Now, why was it a monopoly of the Survey of India? Because during the period uh, of British occupation, the British occupiers did not want any of the natives or any of their rivals to have good maps of this country. So naturally, they made it into a monopoly. Now, question is, why did we continue, continue it after ind independence? Um, especially when it was quite obvious that any military use of it was quite uh, obsolete because anybody, everybody, I mean, from the 70s, People had satellites which were taking photographs of all uh, military installations. The Indian Air Force has been using US Air Force maps in the Himalayas. Absolutely. So, why is it that it required that it required you to come to 2021 when everybody already was using Google Maps illegally, technically, uh, for us to open this up? Because the, there was this idea this is in our back of our minds that somehow uh, the default is that the government controls it, unless it opens it up. Whereas, in fact, we should have the opposite view, that unless there is an overriding reason, it should be open, and on only if there is an overriding reason do you uh, control it. So, our default has always been the Maibap, that daddy will allow you, then you're allowed to stay out late. So, this hmm. is the fundamental problem. Hmm. And give me some more examples uh, of things said in economic surveys which have been followed up or which have been implemented. So, for example, one thing we talked about was taxpayers' rights. So, ironically, 
you know, we have always talked about, you know, what are the, the rules in the Income Tax Act, for example, or about, about the taxpayer, thou shalt pay on time, thou shalt do this and thou shalt do that, all directed towards the taxpayer. What about, what are the rights of the taxpayer vis-a-vis -vis the tax collector? So if you notice, just about six months ago, we have explicitly laid out what are the rights of the taxpayer. Now, of course, the enforcement of that also requires an ombudsman system, which we, will, we are thinking about. But at least we have laid out explicitly what are the rights of the taxpayer vis-a-vis -vis the tax collector. So I think the, the point being made here is that the limits of the state are also being laid out. So this is not, as I, as I keep pointing out, this is not a case of a libertarian who wants a minimalist state or a hardcore Marxist who wants a withering away of no, the state. No, but this is not the case. In India, in many areas where you need the state, it doesn't exist enough. We need, for example, more police. We need more judges. <laughs> we need more teachers. We need more government doctors. All that is not... So, in fact, Indian state has to grow in many areas. Absolutely right. So, <clears throat> if you go back to 1991, what was it about? It we was need a, more diplomats. I agree. So, in 1991, what did we do, try to do is try to stop the government from doing the things it should not be doing. Yeah. And it's still in complete business. We are still trying to get into privatization, this and that. But as we get into sort of reform 2.0, this is about trying to get the state to do the things it should be doing. Hmm. And what should it be doing? It should be providing municipal governance. It should be buying better, gu better guns for its army and defending the borders in Ladakh. And it should be enforcing contracts. In fact, if you want an economy basically run by the private sector, this basically means that you're dealing with autonomous groups of people, companies or various autonomous agents which have various contracts with each other. That it's not the state that decides through licenses or whatever how the system will work. It is run through contracts. Now, you cannot have a contract-based system where there are 37 million cases stuck in the legal system. In fact, if you look at ease of doing business rankings, the one area in which get, we get spanked, in fact, we get spanked in two areas. One is construction permits. The second is enfor enforcement of contracts. Yes, and both of them are good examples of what is wrong. One of them, a construction permit, is an area where the state, you know, obviously there's no country in the world where construction permits are randomly distributed right. by right. the market. That is something the state will have to do. There's some control will have to be imposed. And the other is enforcement of contract that the judicial system has to enforce. Both of them are state failures. See, there's, in, there's a large amount of literature that is taught in economics classes in every uh, university in India about market failure. And indeed, there is market failure. But the fact of the matter is an equal problem is that of state failure. State failure, yes. And that is unfortunately assumed not to exist. So I have tried very hard, in fact, to talk about state failure. If you look, read my economic survey, this year's economic survey has a whole chapter. I think it's chapter six in volume one on regulations and the problem is that our entire regulatory system is based on this idea that look we must have regulation for every possible outcome also we make rules and laws for lawbreakers yes absolutely so this is the same concept that you know the we create rules for lawbreakers so what happens is the lawbreakers continue to uh, not follow the law it's the poor compliant person who has to comply with all these rules and is carrying around the weight so this is precisely the problem and the reason this happens is because in the back of our minds in the end we still have this uh, for, for economists, this is called an arrow debra model of the world, where basically the idea is that it is possible to work out what the all the possible outcomes are and to work out precisely what you should do in each of those circumstances. And this is cons a great law in India, a great regulation in India is one where you worked out all the possible outcomes and have a protocol for each one of them. Now, in the real world, there are an infinite number of possible paths that history can take. So, consequently, it is always obvious that we will end up in a situation which was not prescribed. So, all our reaction then is to add another five 
rules to take care of those new situations and very quickly it becomes so unwieldy and complicated hmm. that nobody can follow any of the rules it hmm. is actually not possible to be a law abiding citizen in this country absolutely because yes. at, even at this point i'm sure i am breaking some rule uh, or the other by simply existing hmm. so therefore you then create circumstances for um rent seeking and other things that then come with a situation yeah because when you have when you have systems like this then you must have discretion also Absolutely. for someone to, and and that so if you were to now it's a wider plane and then i will come to questions from our audience hmm. uh, and our guests uh, on a wider plane if you were to rebuild the indian state okay a new social contract between indian state india's economy and people what would you do first of all i think we should be very clear about what the state should be doing state should be providing certain basic things and here i'm taking the judiciary and 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 the wider state into account and here i would go back actually to the original arthashastra of kautilya it's very interesting people tend to remember kautilya as um some sort of a guy who was thinking only about enemies, enemies and how to fix and them, spies, yes. spies and things yes, like that yes. but in fact the arthashastra is actually quite a wide document yeah. and while you may not want in modern times to use some of his uh, exact prescriptions in terms of you know how to deal with punishments and things no, like that but that was 300 yeah, years ago there was uh, there was uh, yeah 2500 uh, 300 years ago but the general concept of state craft in it is actually right so what does he really want you to do he wants the government to essentially provide external and internal security he, the government uh, or the state issues currency it uh, regulates bads so social bads like um uh, in 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 the case of kotelia he, he regulates prostitution alcohol and so on uh, i for one am a, a great believer that bad should be regulated not banned yeah. in india everything is either mandatory but, or but, it is banned but that's what kotelia said he mm. said regulate he didn't want it absolutely. banned yes he is absolutely clear on this and then of course things like uh, urban in design fact, and municipal issues if we were issues. a kotelian state mm. we would allow betting in cricket yes we would a lot of the match fixing will go absolutely so he was very much about regulating rather than banning again very different from the indian state today today the indian state either makes everything mandatory or it bans it hmm. so ironically while you can keep aside his exact prescriptions from his time but look at his underlying thinking then kotilya basically saying that the indian state is basically to provide certain things that the market cannot provide also interesting about the indian uh, about the kotilian state and this is very very interesting is that people think of kotilya as an extremely suspicious person but if you read the uh, the text you will see he's not suspicious of the average citizen he's mostly suspicious of the government officials hmm. he in fact says that just like it is impossible to tell how much water a fish is drinking in the uh, while swimming around in the water it is not possible to tell how much Uh, treasury funds a official is skimming off while he is doing his functioning hmm. so the kotilian state is extremely suspicious of the government official and hmm. so uh, the kotilian state is a strong state kotilya is not a libertarian he is, has no sense of humor about the things that yeah, the state yeah. does but then he completely circumscribes what the state is allowed to do and so this is what i would consider as being what the indian state should do there are certain things it should do it should do them well and should do nothing else so i come to now <coughs> the business part business end of it yatin shah from iifl hmm. uh he's referring to economic survey uh, it talks about wealth creation for indians and it talks about uh, you talked about a multifaceted strategy to get to 5 trillion dollar economy so he wants to know from you from where will this come how much of it will come from digital economy and where else will it come from and also as we go ahead what will change do you think the contributing pie will change from digital to something else to something else or do you think the timelines will change so to answer this question i will have to say this question itself violates my philosophical framework so let me explain this you see <laughs> the post covid world is not going to be a reinflation of the pre covid world it will have its own geopolitics it will have its own uh, technology consumer behavior 
supply chains and so on. And there is no way on earth that even the best consultant, the best economist is going to know where exactly this is going to head. So while the government may take a few bets through PLI schemes and so on, to a large extent, this world that will emerge is essentially unknown. The jobs of the future for 10 years out are not, will be completely new jobs. Uh, uh, so I think the Indian state should not be in the business of trying to predict too much of this. The job of the Indian state is one, to create the physical infrastructure that is definitely going to be needed. And here also we should keep an open mind about the changing needs uh, of the economy. But other than that, we should basically get simple taxation, deregulate to the extent possible and create spaces for the animal spirits of the, gov of the private sector to generate these jobs. If I knew where those digital jobs are going to emerge, I shouldn't be wasting my time sitting here having this conversation with you. I should actually be Elon Musk investing in all these things. Since I do not know, I, I am an economist. If I didn't, I would be a billionaire. If, if I knew, I would, be, uh, I would be a billionaire investing in these areas. So the point is, it's not the business of the state other than occasionally to create clusters or for um, you know, emerging uh, to provide protection to an emerging sector. But it has to create an environment for entrepreneurship. Absolutely. <clears throat> it needs to create an environment for an entrepreneurship. As I said, that requires deregulation. It requires certain amount of physical infrastructure that has to be in place. It requires simplification of the tax system. And we have simplified the corporate tax uh, structure in late 2019, if you remember. I think the direct taxes on, uh, on on individuals also needs to be significantly simplified from where and we, we are. And we came close to it. There was a direct taxes code, but what happened? We got cold feet. Well, uh, it was uh, discussed very th thoroughly and I believe my colleague, the chief economic advisor, yes. was involved in uh, uh, looking through it. I don't know what its current status is, but there is a draft of it which has been discussed. Yes. Yeah. So, the second part of his question, do you see uh, $5 trillion uh, economy achieved by then or do you think this will be a case of shifting timelines? I think some shift of timeline may happen but I think the drift will be much smaller than people fear. Um, and so let me explain. First of all, uh, the shock that came to from the COVID, yes, obviously the worldwide we got hit by it, we got hit by it in India as well. But I think you will see a very strong recovery. Now, in the economic survey, we talk about a 11% real GDP growth rate. Uh, that, uh, with uh, uh, inflation and other things, we'll probably in nominal terms hit 15%. 15%, yes. But I think that is a conservative number. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be very, very surprised if it is not significantly higher than this. You are not concerned about the return of COVID. The second wave is growing quite well, menacingly. As I said, since I'm a compl I am ai believe in the, my whole theory and philosophy is about uncertainty and random shocks. I never write off the pop possibility of new strains coming and causing all kinds of other disruption. But I'm an, also an optimist. I think we did rather well in containing the first round. Yeah. Uh, vaccines are on the way. And but but I, are we messing up a little with the second round by keeping the vaccine process too controlled? Well... Well, I'm not the person who's running the health side I know, of it. I know, I know, I know. So, take my words with a pinch of salt. But I think there is a case for doing it step by step. And let me explain why. You see, in India, there's always large numbers of people. And rolling out of any such thing has to be done in a phased manner. Simply because if you suddenly open the whole thing up, there will be queues of people uh, queuing up to get themselves um, vaccinated on suddenly on the first day. Then the media will turn up there, aapka vaccine aaj bhi nahi hua, kal bhi nahi hua, dekhiye kaisa hua. So, I think... But abhi to, abhi to people are not turning up, that is the so problem. So, fine, in which enough. case we open out the gates yeah. wider and wider till, till the whole... And remember, many of these things worldwide, all the vaccines are now still being done under experimental I basis. But the point so, is, we have to maintain certain amount point of control is when on it. it. When the first wave came, we had nothing to fight it with. Now, we have a shield. Yes. Uh, but it is, it is initially at least, an unknown shield. Too many people wanted that shield. Now we have used that shield for a while. Okay, we have tempered it, adjusted it at the edges. More people have been told that where to buy the shield. Hmm. And so this thing will be opened and opened wider and wider till it'll eventually it'll be like going and buying yourself vitamin C tablet. Yeah. <laughs> because I think the way these uh, vaccines are, I think we'll need one a year at least. Uh, 
Well, at least I, for some time, because vaccines will get better with the course of time. True, and remember also the 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 virus uh, has an incentive to become weaker and weaker. I know because <clears throat> every one of the deadliest diseases in the world eventually become weaker and weaker because yeah. from the vaccines perspective. They don't want to kill you too quickly. Right, right. They want to be weak and spread as far as possible. Right, right. So, most of these uh, uh, viruses and other disease over time become weaker, and we it'll become like any other flu that we get once a year. Yeah. So we have Sanjay Agarwal of uh, AU Bank. It's mm. a small finance bank which mm. is doing very well. Uh, one of the new ones, uh, and he has a concern about as MSMEs, and I don't understand this very much. But he's in the market. He says that now MSME status has been withdrawn from traders. So with that, traders no longer have access to bank loans that they would have had if they were MSMEs. And in rural India, generally in the unorganized sector, uh, interest rates are usurious: 36 percent, 39 percent, 40 percent, because people are desperate to borrow. So, is so, something being done to bring so, them in the uh, so, picture? Uh, so, this is not, we don't have any ideological problem about this. Right. This is a problem that has been brought to our notice. Right. And uh, if, uh, and I agree that you, you do want uh, the trading sector to be uh, alive and well. And in fact, uh, I can say that uh, without this sector and the small shop, network of small Kirana shops in the country, we would not have survived through the lockdowns over the last uh, one year. So this, uh, you know, the small trader is an important part of our economic system, and we want to support it. Yes. So this has been brought to us, and there are people looking into this uh, issue as we speak. So whatever sensible can be done to adjust for this will be done. So Sanjay Agrawal, be reassured that this is being uh, paid attention yes. to. So the follow-up question he asks is again something that I don't know. That now even sm very small entrepreneurs or traders have to register on Udyam portal. And in rural India, many people may not know this because by April 1, 2021, everybody has to be on it. So, are you, what are you doing to evangelize it, to make it easier so people don't well, get I, caught? Since I'm not running it, I don't know yeah, what the right. process of evangelizing is. But uh, the idea here is that e there is a, some form of formalization is a good thing. Hmm. Because once you have formalized it, then you are allowed even providing support is easier to do. See, the problem is not that the government doesn't want to provide support and other things to various sectors. But as shown with the Jandhan system or even with the direct transfers of various kinds of benefits, once you have some identification and ability to uh, target somebody, then you can provide support in a much simpler targeted way with lesser leakages. Hmm. So, that is all that is being attempted here. Now, it is possible that the evangelizing of this is not adequate and I can't comment on that since I don't know. But the, the concept is basically this. Once you have clearly have a system of identification and now most of these people anyway have an identification because of GST and other things that they're doing. Yeah, right, so, this is not, right. not something that they're going right. completely off kilter. Right, right. All they have to do is connect to three things they are already doing. Then it allows the whole system to function smoothly. Today, do you see GST as a success or as a failure? I would agree. Uh, I would say it's a huge success. And here again, <clears throat> let me say, introducing something like GST or for that matter, the Insolvency Bankruptcy Code, these are framework issues. What, Whenever we introduced it, at some point in our hist economic history, we had to introduce them. And whenever we did it, it would have been disruptive. But now that some point time has passed, I would say that this system is, most businesses will ag agree that this system works reasonably smoothly. It is a significant improvement on whatever used to exist because it's not as if the, some system didn't exist before. The question is, is this system significantly better than whatever exists hmm. before? And I think most people will agree it does. Even small businesses who used to complain more about it. Big businesses always thought it was a good idea. And it certainly has created an Indian common market. Hmm. So not so long ago, it was easier for Mumbai to trade with Shanghai than to trade with Delhi. That has now certainly changed. We do have genuinely have but a common some market. Of us, some of that is getting messed up now with the, the states coming up with these new laws, 75% local, 75% locals. That is so, the, that so is the that, opposite that is in a of different, common market. Uh, well, uh, the labor market, yes. yes. So now, one of the interesting things that will happen here, 
because you can no longer con con uh, protect, in a sense, your goods market, trying to provide protectionism to your labor market will have some interesting consequences because now there is huge incentives for other states to wean away your businesses because they can sell you the goods right, from exactly, anywhere else. Exactly. So, a competitive federalism will take care of this. Yeah, see, Punjab and Haryana, they could face a situation where Bihar and UP say we are not allowing our labor to go to your states. No, so, forget about allowing. The fact is the businesses will shift. This is perfectly why, exactly why you want a common market. See, in the European common market, what happens? Either you allow the Poles to and Romanians to move to your place or the businesses will move to Poland. Hmm. Now you decide how you wish it. Hmm. I mean, maybe for social stability, you want to uh, uh, reserve it for yourself. That's perfectly so fine. So, what will be your advice to Haryana government and Jharkhand government? My advice would not be to them. My hmm. advice would be to their competitor state <laughs> to uh, kindly come to Gurgaon and wean away uh, them. The, the let let, yes. let, let uh, the competitive energies of uh, different states uh, mm -hmm. do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. I, I have no advice for people who want to introduce rest restrictions. It's because I, saw, I read this Haryana law and it said that in areas where uh, you can prove to us that the necessary expertise does not exist. We will permit you to have uh, workers from outside. That's like an H-1B visa within India. Yes, except you do, you do not have any control on services and goods being supplied. Right. So, all I'm trying to say is, <coughs> let the market function. Ah. Now, it may be that um, Haryana then uh, moves up the value chain into areas that are above their 50,000 uh, rupee uh, slab and it becomes the Silicon Valley of India and all the uh, high-tech people want to live in Gurgaon and all the low-tech uh, stuff moves out. That's also perfectly fine. Ah, it awesome. is for them to judge. I'm right. not here to judge. Yeah. All I, my Except it will lose their purpose of creating low-paid low jobs. The, Maybe yes, maybe yeah. not. But that is, as I said, it That's is a democracy. Problem, yes. It is a democracy. Let the feedback loop of democracy and economics then uh, uh, play itself out. My mm. my main objection usually is uh, to the idea that th is in fact to this idea that they will allow these exceptions. Because that will mean that some uh, be bureaucrat is now. allowed to take a judgment on whether this should be allowed or that should be allowed. Mm. That is where my main no, we objection also, is. We also know if it was if it was a simple rule. We also know who's the minister squatting over these portfolios, and he. Uh, that, um, as I said, I know, can't they, comment I on know. it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a coalition issue. Coalition Dharma issue. Nevertheless, so there is a young uh, fellow from Haryana. Since you mentioned Haryana yes. just now, uh, who you and I both know, uh, Arjun Kadyan. Uh, okay. And it's a question away from our theme, who says that you've in the past talked about leveraging Haryana's cultural wealth uh, yes. to create more interest besides agriculture. Right. Uh, so, in fact, uh, you know, my, my, uh, I've argued in many places that, uh, you know, particularly we Bengalis tend to have this dismissive idea about certain parts of northern India as not being cultured. Right. The irony is that... Um, uh, Indic uh, civilizations, uh, uh, sort of origins, uh, lie in Haryana. Uh, this is Brahmavarta, the land between the Saraswati and the Dishadvati, both of them now dried rivers. And <clears throat> of course, now we have archaeologically found some of the largest uh, Bronze Age sites in yeah. Haryana. Yeah. Uh, Raki Gadi, as you know, is uh, uh, as large as Harappa plus Mohenjadaro combined. So, in, in some ways, this is the heart of our civilization. And uh, Haryana, ironically, does not leverage this at all. I mean, whether it's the sites of, of the Mahabharat or the, or the sites of the uh, Rig Veda are all in Haryana. Haryana builds these tourist complexes near canals and stuff. Yes, but let me give you examples of unbelievable things which are uh, uh, not um, uh, explored by Haryanvis themselves. So, not very far from here, about an hour and hour drive south of here through Gurgaon, there's a hill called Dhosi Hill mm -hmm. in uh, very close to the Haryana-Rajasthan <coughs> border. Now, uh, it's a part of the Ravali Hills and it is one of the oldest uh, geological features on this planet. It is an ancient volcano. It's a pyramidical shape and if you bother to climb to the top of it, there is a caldera with a small kund. I see. 
Now, it's a beautiful place, by the way, and beautiful views of the surrounding landscape. But it is a very interesting place for other reasons. This is the original place where the Bhrigu family of Rishis used to uh, live and had their hermitage. And there was a Rishi called Chavanya, who was Bhrigu Rishi's son, who took a dip because he had leprosy, I believe, and he took a dip in this kund and he was cured. And after he got cured, he became the father of Ayurveda. So Chavanya Prash is from oh, Chavanya Rishi. From there. Okay. So he had his hermitage in right. there. And the point of the matter, it's a beautiful location. And if you climb up... You, this, you've been walking up and down the Aravlis quite a bit. Absolutely. I, I see from your Twitter uh, yes. posting. So there. it's a phenomenally beautiful landscape. And I'm amazed that almost nobody goes there. I spent a day walking up this with Arjun, in fact. And from there, you can see the Khetri mines, uh, copper mines, copper mines uh, yes. on one side. Uh, on the other side, you can see where the Drishadvati and the Saraswati meet, used to meet. And further out, although it, it's a hazy, because it's too hazy, you can't see it. But I believe not far away, if you were looking due north, you would be able to see Rakigadi. So this is really the heart of Indian civilization. Mm. And yet we don't bother with this at all. I mean, mm. most Haryanavis don't know about it. Most certainly don't. <laughs> at least I did. For that also, we need a Bengali to come and find it for us. See? <laughs> Yes, maybe... You, you Bengalis have been ignoring us. <laughs> maybe, uh, yes, you need a few more Bengalis digging around. After all, even the discovery of the Harappan sites was done by Rakhal Das. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, Sanjay, coming back to uh, our sort of more common themes. Uh, Prabodh Thakkar, who runs an insurance company, the Global Insurance Brokers Private Limited, he says, how can Indian companies support other Indian companies in India under Aapnirbhar Bharat in such a way that it's not seen as narrowness, protectionism or parochialism? So, I think I do need to explain what Atmanirbhar Bharat is. So, first of all, let me clearly state, this is not some attempt to return to pre-1991 import substitution. Uh, neither I nor anybody in the government has any interest in going back and to driving. And you are sure the Prime Minister doesn't want it and there is this Swatish Jagrad Manch kind of pressure doesn't work? I can clearly tell you that the Prime Minister has no interest in going back to driving in ambassador cars again. Hmm. So, what does this really mean? So, I need to explain this if you will give me. So, about a year ago when this whole COVID thing started, we discovered something interesting about one of our most competitive sectors, which is our drugs and pharmaceutical sector. Everybody loves our drugs and pharmaceutical sector. Everybody agrees that it is extremely globally competitive. But we learned very quickly that it was entirely dependent on APIs from China. Absolutely. Single source APIs from China. So, we have decided to provide a certain amount of protection to create at least some of these APIs should come from India or at least they should diversify to in some. In fact, a lot of the antibiotic APIs were produced in India. And as the laws got twisted in India and in China, all this shifted to China. Absolutely. So, now if I say I want to provide a certain amount of protection for having the key APIs, APIs not everyone. Active pharmaceutical intermediaries, what is it? A uh, API, good question. Uh, active pharmaceutical inputs, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm not dead oh, sure. About. I have now forgotten. They're about. They're about. <laughs> but it's yeah. basically pharmaceutical inputs. That, that's right. And <clears throat> the idea basically is the following, that if I decide to provide a certain amount of protections that some, the key ones get produced in India, this is not an act of protectionism in the pre-1991 sense. This is merely being practical about managing the resilience of an extremely competitive global industry. This is how we think about this. Same thing is true, we'll provide protection for certain kinds of defense sectors. Now, but this is very different from, say, stopping foreign companies from coming and doing business here. Far from it, we are opening up certain sectors for them to do. We are allowing foreign companies to come here and invest in defense. We are opening up uh, insurance just in this budget. We have done 74% now. So what we want basically saying that come and do business here. This is true of foreign business coming here. But we are also telling, as your question pointed out, we want Indian industry to go out there and do their stuff. So deregulate it, encourage domestic competition, but also domestic industry. Provide in certain areas a certain amount of support. And that is where these... PLI schemes, the production linked incentive schemes. Do your thing, do it in India, provide in new technologies, bring them in here, 
train our guys and of course trigger Indian animal spirits to go and invest. But are we then also looking at CBI cases uh, five years down the line and how people misuse the PLI scheme? Now, of course, if somebody misuses it, uh, as I said, the strong but limited state Limited bit is what we talked about, but the strong part is also important. Ah. The Cotillion state has no sense of humor about misusing. Hmm. So, the same state that l is suspicious and uh, of its officials and limits them also does not uh, take lightly to people breaking its laws. So, minimum uh, government is good, but uh, maximum governance is also a part of the deal. Hmm. Right, right. Good. So, <laughs> YP Rajesh, who is our managing editor, hmm. uh, he wants to know hmm. bank bank privatization. Two banks have to be privatized this year. Uh, one insurance company. Uh, how confident are you that government will be able to do it, given the fact that we've just had protests on farm laws and then also some labor uh, labor protests? Uh, in fact, there's another question from a young colleague of mine, P. R. Krishnan Kutti, who says that. What does this bank strike indicate? Does it in indicate that pressure is already building up? Clearly, there will be people who will oppose this. Otherwise, somebody else would have done it. So, nobody is claiming that these are simple things to do, whether it's the farm laws or privatization or any other kind of reform. If there was no opposition to it, then clearly somebody would have already done it. So, the fact that there is some opposition does not come as a great surprise. The question is, is it worthwhile to do? Mm. And are we committed to it? That is the main question you are asking. And let me say, we are committed to it. In the case of the farm laws, we are willing to talk to the farmers. There may be genuine issues that need to be, the edges can be maybe uh, uh, you know smoothened out. But we, co we continue to be committed to the general idea. After all, these reforms were debated for something like three decades. That's right. And I don't think this I, this argument uh, uh, f flows through that, oh, there was not enough consultation. I'm afraid there was consultation and consultation and consultation. So, my view is they need to be done while the exact way in which it was done can be smoothened out. But I think we are, I mean, I think the, the political leadership and certainly technocrats like myself are completely con uh, committed to it. The same thing is true, by the way, of privatization. Just as an aside, Many of these companies, by the way, used to be private companies. Exactly. So, all the oil companies, for example, uh, insurance companies. They, they, Air India, the private most companies. of these Air banks India. were all private companies. They were taken over. Um, now, one can have a long debate about whether it was sensible to take it over at that time. Some people will say it was. I am of the belief even at that point in time, they were. it was perhaps not a good idea. No, in, in fact, government wanted... Uh, to do more banking, they could have set up new banks of their own. Absolutely. And in fact, what happened when the initial uh, nationalization happened, right in the beginning, large financial scandals happened. India's first financial scandal in Mundra. the mid 50s, where the Mundra scandal was linked to, uh, to LIC being uh, nationalized. Yes. So, right in the beginning, there was something fishy about the whole business of nationalization. So, therefore, my own view is there is, and since then, by the way, there's been a huge amount of value destruction in many of these institutions. Uh, many did not grow to the extent they could, and many of them, of course, became hugely loss making and, you know, continue to gobble up large amounts of resources, uh, whether it's BSNL or MTNL. Or I think a very good example is Coal India, because as global coal prices have gone up, Coal India's co uh, stock price has come down. So, you know, we can keep debating these individual companies. So, as a concept, it is very clear that in many areas, we do need to privatize. Now, I have no ideological uh, problem with retaining certain amount of uh, public sector. There are many areas you want public sector. Clearly, in defense, the state should have some capacity. Even in finance, by the way, some yes, amount yes. of banking should be in yes. uh, public hands. After all, even India's Private banks have not covered themselves in glory. Absolutely, they have, yes. they have different problems, ah. but they do have their own problems. Ah, ah. So, <clears throat> I am of the view that there are strategic sectors where the government does need to maintain certain amount of presence and they should and that is our policy. But for many things, you should uh, now allow the private sector to either take it over completely, like in airlines and hotels and things like that, or more space should be created for them to function. So, for example, in the case of the banking sector, Today, we have almost two-thirds, almost 70% of the banking system is in public hands. Now, even if I make a case 
that some part of e into the you know foreseeable future or forever some part of the banking system will be always be public even if i accept that and i think that is the case then even then you cannot make the case that 70% of it should be in the public, in public, se yes. uh, public sector yes, yes. so some space creation for the private sector has to be there so some of it should happen through the existing private sector growing some of it should happen through new players coming in and i am a votary for allowing new uh, uh, private banks to come in or, <laughs> and of course to uh, on the edges some uh, uh, some two banks or uh, or whatever number is suitable should be allowed to be privatized so too so are you are you okay with the idea of corporates running uh, industrial groups running banks that is a more complicated question <clears throat> there is one question should private sector be allowed a bigger space unequivocally yes yes in the case of allowing the corporate sector to come in then you have to manage an additional problem which is of conflict of interest hmm. should then a bank which lend is lend to that group lend to the same group now <clears throat> if it is a stand alone institution which is doing its own thing then i have no problem if it is linked to another group and it is lending to the same group then the question is who decides on credit quality will they be able to will the chinese walls be good enough uh, that some amount of favoritism doesn't happen after all the banking system in the end in every country is implicitly backed by taxpayers yeah so consequently we will end up implicitly backing an entire corporate group so this is a much more complicated issue than saying private sector being allowed in mm. and here i have some misgivings of being completely allowing free uh, yeah. uh, sort of laser fair so yes. there has to be some restrictions and they have to be carefully designed so i this is not an area where i uh, i want yeah. uh, you know free flow yeah so ramya ramya nayar who's my colleague who you mm -hmm. might know she covers business and finance for us she's taking us back to the retrospective tax that arun jetli had promised who you knew very well yes he was very fond of you uh, he had promised a long time back that this retrospective taxation laws will be withdrawn why has it still not happened and do foreign investors now still carry a sense of grievance or concern about what a foreign care see retrospective taxes is not a good idea and uh, former uh, finance minister jetli had on the floor of the parliament promised that it will never happen again so the question is what do we do with the legacy cases and the government has so far allowed it simply to go to its logical conclusion it is now basically at the end of whatever can be done in that process and my sense is that in the end as whatever happens um you know a something will work out which will work for everybody but so it we, is not something uh, this is not an experiment we would want to repeat ever again so will you still want to appeal this cairn and vodafone arbitration decision well it, this is a decision obviously above my pay grade so <laughs> uh, but uh, as i said uh, as a, the theoretician of the government uh -huh. let me say this is not an experiment we want to do again, ever again yeah yeah okay uh, ramakrishna prayag very simple question mm. he works for jindal steel and power how will the indian economy function in the next 3 years 3 years of this government obviously fair enough. so i think clearly one major issue is the revival process which is clearly in uh, that we are uh, signaled in our uh, the recently announced budget that this is about reconstruction and rebuilding and getting the momentum of the economy going again and here we have taken a path which is somewhat different from what other countries have done and what many other experts may have advised us to do first of all <coughs> we have gone for uh, providing fiscal support but we have taken a peculiar path for it which is that we have done it almost exclusively through uh, capital expenditure many um, experts and economists were of the opinion we should have gone for trying to boost uh, consumption expenditure through various kinds of transfers Uh, the america has for example gone for stimulus checks and I so i know on. but you know but when people are scared hmm. they don't want to spend you transfer money to them they'll put it in the bank that is precisely the point th that we made as right. one of the reasons why we did not do this the second reason is let's be clear we are going to run up debts to do this future generations will have to repay it we want to leave 
assets, assets for them. Yes. So this is one part of why we wanted to make sure that capital expenditure is the path we want to take. And unlike maybe a developed country, uh, we have lots of physical infrastructure that needs to be built. Yeah. So why not use yeah. this as an opportunity yeah. to build it? I mean, you can consider it the Eisenhower moment or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you may want to call this or the New Deal. But, you know, why not use that? Yeah, America is still using the highways they built, uh, that they built when they built them. Absolutely. So yeah. this is one, one part of what we uh, uh, wanted to do. And so if you look at the fiscal deficit, we have allowed for that fiscal deficit to eventually drift down over three years to the original path, but I have not tried to squeeze it there very mm. quickly. Mm. The other thing that many, uh, especially US-based Indian economists were of the opinion that we should then finance this with very high tax rates. But we have been very, very clear that we are not going to do this. I think the demand for high tax rates is to hurt, is to be seen to be hurting everybody else but me. Yes, my view all, uh, always was that those who advocate these high tax rates should advocate it in the country of their residents. Exactly. So that they and their progeny pay for it. Right. I think that in India, we should be trying to go for growth. I mean, you may still be too young for it, but you know, uh, I, I was in college when India had 97% tax. 97.48% tax. Well, I don't remember it in memory, yeah. but I certainly uh, have read I mean, enough about the I mean, times. That, that's when we gave birth to the black economy. It's not just about the black economy, in terms of sheer fairness. Yeah. If you want the uh, private sector to be taking risks, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, and you want creative destruction, and you are saying that we are going to have the insolvency and bankruptcy court, which will liquidate you if you get it wrong, then on the other side, you have to also have the system that if you did get it right, and you were lucky, you, and you, you pay all of it to me, then you pay it all of it to me cannot be true. We have to allow that person, the, the incentive structures to be such that people take risks. So in a risk-taking economy, you've got to have a system where taxes are kept low. And so in 2019, we had brought down the, ta the, uh, the corporate tax rates. And let me say, if a time comes where we are earning enough in revenues because there's enough momentum in the economy, this should also be done for personal tax personal rates. Personal taxes. It's just that it's it's yeah. just that we don't have the space to bring everything down. Right. But now. ideally, we should have very low tax rates and simple tax rates. Yeah. Uh, Sanjeev, last question I will take is from somebody who knows what she's talking about. Again, Ramya, inflation targeting strategy that India has right now. Do you think it is right? And what's your view on inflation? Sujit Bhalla has written something today in the Express. Uh, so, it depends what you thought the inflation targeting system was set up to do. Hmm. The purpose of the inflation targeting system was, in my view, to basically anchor India's inflation into the 2 to 6 percent range right. from an earlier range of 8 to 12 percent range. We were never a very high yeah. inflation country in the Latin American sense. No, no, no. Only, only in early mid-70s, 74, 75. Yeah. But by and large, but, but we even, were… But even then was 27, 28 yeah. percent annual. So Yes, and, and th th that era was everybody has high yeah, inflation. Everybody. But we were basically an 8 to 12 percent inflation country. The, uh, the inflation targeting was successful in the limited thing that it was supposed to bring inflation back into this 2 to 4 percent range. And it did a decent job of that. 2 to 6 percent. Uh, sorry, 2 to 6 percent yeah. range. Yeah. And it did, a, if that was what it was meant to do, it was successful. Now, I agree with Sujit Bhalla, it was helped in this process by the fact that global inflation also was well behaved during this period. Right. And yes, maybe we were lucky in that. Right. But the inflation targeting uh, system for the thing it was set up to do, succeeded. Now comes the next question. First, was there a price we paid for this? Yes, we did. Because for a period of time, I would argue, we had to keep monetary policy tighter than we would have otherwise kept it. And that, in that, uh, and by the way, I am, uh, you know, I'm publicly known to have been uh, a critic of keeping real interest rates uh, too high for too long uh, during the period 16, 17, 18. Uh, so it will come as no surprise that I think at that point in time we should have loosened things uh, without having too much uh, inflation Confirm, yes. uh, 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 in the system. But nevertheless, um, the fact is the, the that was really a management failure. It was not a problem of the inflation target because after all at that stage if you remember 
there were two occasions where the inflation rate actually fell below right. the two percent bottom. So I think the monetary managers of that time should have been a little more careful and uh, should have perhaps managed it such that it uh, it it was brought more towards the center, the four percent range. But anyway, uh, done is done. But that is not a failure of the target uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I would take Surjit Bhalla's second argument more seriously, where he also argues that the CPI basket should be regularly updated. That I think is a fair… That is the consumer price index. Yes, yeah, the consumer price <coughs> index. Our basket uh, of consumption is now significantly different from what the consumer basket now reflects. Uh, food has clearly come off very significantly. Any country which becomes richer, its, it's importance uh, food, uh, of food in our basket goes down. And those of new things like, for example, <coughs> our mobile phone has become an important part of our basket. That should now reflect in our… Uh, it's called data CPU. over ATA. <laughs> data over ATA. Uh, so, uh, but uh, every generation, uh, why? Every 10 years it has to update it. So, the time I think has come to have a CPI which reflects our consumption basket. And that would also remove all these other complications. Is this core? Should it be core? All of these discussions. So, what are the bond into. prices telling us now? So, Globally, Yield, yields are going up yes. in India. So, this has to be, so the Indian global uh, popping up of yields has to be seen in the context of what is happening globally. And this is, this is a little uh, evolved. So because in your previous avatar, you yeah. worked for a, an international bank. Yes, and I, you know, uh, my job was to bet on interest rates and right. exchange rates. Right. So, he, this is actually a very involved issue. So, you'll have to give me a few minutes to explain sure, sure, this. Sure. You see, as a part of this reinflation the, of the world, the reserve currency issuing countries, particularly the US, has pumped out a huge amount of money huh. supply. Now, it was needed from the narrow perspective of reinflating the economy from where we are right now. However, here comes the tricky bit. What happens when you increase the amount of money by such a large amount when it is not clear when you will be able to suck it out again. Because any attempt to suck it out too early will cause you to spiral down again. So now the question is, and this is really nobody knows the answer, will this trigger inflation or not? In the US? Well, in the world, because the they world. are the reserve yeah. currency. Right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, because $1.9 trillion more has now come. Well, that is on the fiscal side, right. which will obviously finance also through a, another monetary right. Uh, right. Uh, boost. So, there's a, this huge amount of money sloshing around on the planet and it finds its way into commodity prices like oil prices and every kind of other things uh, through our foreign exchange reserves that even fall, feeds through to our uh, money supply. So, since this is the amount of money that is sloshing around, the question is, will it trigger inflation or not? Now, there are many theories on this. <clears throat> there are those who will argue and there's something called modern monetary theory which will argue that no, this doesn't really matter because the link between money supply <coughs> and uh, inflation is rather a weak one. In the very long run, maybe there is an impact. But if, if inflation does come back, there's more than adequate time to withdraw this monetary stimulus and so on. And others who will argue that, look, so much money will eventually be a bad thing. In any case, what will, the, the danger is that what will happen here is that uh, you will trigger this inflation and you will get stagflation and you know they'll give the experience of the 60s and 70s when you went off the uh, <clears throat> the gold uh, link to, of the dollar to the gold and then you had the spiraling and yes it all ended all very badly and ultimately you know you had to hike up interest rates and stop this whole thing now what is my view on this well i don't have to solve america's problems but mm. i do have to solve look at what the impact is on india i think we have done correctly for the time being we have allowed the rupee to appreciate in a creeping sort of way and accumulated a large amounts of reserves. But this reserves that we are accumulating does not earn us anything and it is denominated in the very reserve currencies that, that are being printed too much off. So at some point in time, we will have to begin to take a call on when we begin to think of the rupee itself as a reserve currency. Hmm. Because that will mean that we will then have to be willing to allow this uh, the rupee to become an international if currency. If I may interrupt yeah. for a second, did you mean we've allowed rupee to appreciate or depreciate slowly? Appreciate. Appreciate. See, if you look at the rupee in the last one year, ah, it's, it's, the, it's been in terms of in appreciated. inflation, it has appreciated. Yes. 
So, why is it is appreciated a little bit, but in fact, if the Reserve Bank was not accumulating reserves Dollars, like the yeah. blazes, right. now we have almost 600 billion worth of reserves, the rupee would probably, uh, I'm just guessing, it would probably be at 60 something, 65 or some such level. So, we have creepingly allowed it to appreciate, but stood in the way. Why have we accumulated all these reserves? Well, one part of it is that by accumulating these reserves, we are allowing this money to flow through into our economy, which was a good thing because we wanted excess liquidity in our own financial system during uh, we were going through this shock. So, this, this was one advantage to it. The second advantage to it is that we built up this huge bulwark of reserves, which means that we now have more reserves than we have debt. Hmm. So, India, interestingly, is currently a net creditor country to the rest of the world, including private sector uh, debt. This means that whether we get a ratings downgrade or whatever other shocks may come our way, we are insulated from it because we are a creditor country in the end. And so, this is a good thing. We have built this bulwark. But there is a limit to this bulwark. Should we have $2 trillion worth of reserves? No, because we earn nothing, no, no returns on this. So, what do we do? Do we allow the rupee to keep appreciating uh, against the dollar? Especially when we are nothing, uh, um, since we are not earning anything against the dollar. Um, if it keeps appreciating, is it bad for uh, uh, our exports? These are all decisions that have to be taken in a, in a, uh, according to the circumstance. There is no, what should I say, there is no rule book to play by. Particularly because we are entering a zone where if we aspire to be a global economy, you know, five trillion dollar economy or even bigger eventually, then we have got to begin to think seriously about at some point, not immediate future, at 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the rupee itself being a reserve currency. Because that is when other countries will be willing to finance us mm -hmm. at near zero interest rates. Right. Huh. It will not happen in immediately, right. but we have to be willing then to begin to doing things like um, be allow the internationalization of the rupee. Cannot be done today. So, don't jump immediately. But we have to begin to think about these issues. So, for example, our inclusion in global bond indices, which we are hoping to do sometime this year. This is a step towards that direction. Well, good. So, before we conclude this, give me your guess. Give us your guess for this year's growth rate. We know Moody's, we know McKinsey, we know Credit Suisse, we know... Uh, the economic survey, give me your guess. Well, since as Estimate. a co-author co of the yes, yes. economic survey, I, I have to say, the economic survey has basically done, uh, gone for 11% uh, uh, plus 4-4.5% uh, four, four inflation, gives you a nominal GDP growth rate somewhere in the 15.5%, 15 15.3%. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is a conservative number. Now, I'm not in a position to put a hard number, right. but let me say that that will be considered eventually a conservative number. I think the reinflation of the Indian economy will be very strong. In fact, we can already witness quite a lot of it, despite ripples along the way, whether, you know, second wave and all that kind of thing. And I think other than a few sectors which we have deliberately held down, like international travel or entertainment and so on, almost all other sectors have seen very, very strong recovery. Strongest in the world. In fact, so much so it is now causing some disruptions. I myself have uh, very recently purchased a car and I had to wait for several months before I got delivery of it because, um, you know, the factories were not able to, uh, to, provide, uh, to keep up. So, I think that's the good news. Um, and uh, as a society, never mind the government, I think as a society, we demonstrated to the world that we can really deal with a big, big shocks. Yeah. Uh, I think the administration, um, I think uh, the, the way even our villages dealt with uh, such a major shock, uh, keeping peace for 1.35 billion people through a big lockdown, um, extreme disruption, the system kept going. And look at the amount of chaos that has happened even in developed countries, uh, whether it's political chaos or, uh, you know, breakdowns in, of all kinds. I think uh, we Indians need to be proud of ourselves. Well, I think on that note, we can conclude this session and given how pretty your neighborhood is, I think I will look forward to doing it again at some point of time. And then we talk about maybe archaeology and culture a little bit more and also urban governance. It will be a pleasure. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. Thank you.